Well, I'm the last speaker, so uh, I know it's been uh, rather long and, and the program's scheduled to end at 6 and we still have questions and a reception, so I'll try to be very brief. I've listened to all the presenters. I've not heard one thing that I disagree with. I think there's been a recurring theme around prevention, intervention, uh, working together, and all those things are true. Uh, what's also true, at least in my experience, and I've been in law enforcement for 43 years, these problems that we're talking about are not new. Uh, these are problems that have been around for generations. I started my career in law enforcement in 1968. And when I think about Chicago in 1968, the early 1970s, the gang activity, kids coming from broken homes, the gang was their family, the amount of violence, the shootings that took place, Granted, they weren't with AK-47s and SKS assault weapons like we see on our streets today, but dead is dead. And it doesn't much matter if you shot with a 22 or a 357 Magnum. Uh, it just doesn't make any difference. But it seems like over the years it's just gotten worse, where the attitude toward violence on the part of some is just, it just doesn't matter. It's very indiscriminate. And unfortunately, in the community, we have gotten desensitized to it. There's no outrage. We cherry pick when we want to become outraged. It all depends. How many of you know, I've heard the name uh, Yassine Harvey? How many of you heard the name Trayvon Martin? All right, good example. Yassine Harvey, was murdered here in Philadelphia on May 3rd of this year. 16-year-old boy, 62nd and Callow Hill, innocent victim, visiting his aunt, decided to go down to the corner store with some friends to get some Chinese food. Guys pull up in a, in a green colored car, mistaken identity, open fire, shooting two times in the head, dead, gone. Now we had 5,000 people march from, from Union Station, from uh, 30th Street Station, down to Love Park in honor of Trayvon Martin. And I'm not saying that wasn't a tragedy. I'm not saying that every death is a loss. But we're losing them right here in our own backyard and ain't doing a damn thing about it. Yeah. Every life has value. And we need to look at it that way. One death in Philadelphia, one kid dying in, in Philadelphia is an offense against the entire city. Doesn't matter if you live in West Philly, doesn't matter if you live in Chestnut Hill. It is an offense against the entire city. There are a lot of people out here doing a lot of good work. I don't want to take anything away from that. But our problem has always been that we can't sustain it. People don't want to deal with solutions because they don't know what to do. And I don't blame them because I don't know what to do either. I know a piece of it is, is, with, with, is with schools. Easy to say, you know, uh, it's the schools. All right, well, there's some truth to that. I mean, without a good education, uh, a lot of things do not fall into place. So we do need quality, but let me tell you something. You can go to any of these so-called uh, persistently dangerous schools, a term that I hate because again, we've labeled that as if I'm in a persistently dangerous school, I need to act persistently dangerous, I guess, because I am a student there, okay? But you can pick the school that you think is the worst school in the city, I don't care what it is. Let me tell you something, if you go to class every day and if you pay attention, you can learn something. We have dysfunctional families in this city. I've not heard anybody talk about families or a lack thereof. Amen. Parents that couldn't tell you what courses their kids are taking wouldn't be able to find a PTA meeting if they're with a GPS. Amen. Pay no attention. Throw them in a room, give them an a, a Xbox, and that's raising your child. I mean, come on. Government cannot raise your child. We can't do it. The criminal justice system was not created to turn people around in that, that the thinking was that punishment would make you see the error of your ways and somehow you would change. Now that's true in some cases, but in a lot of cases it's not the case. It just makes them harder. It makes them worse than they were before. People do eventually age out of it because you hit a certain, you get my age, you can't snatch purses anymore because your knees are bad. You can't run. <laughs> I, that's, it, so, but are we really fixing the problem? And, we, and you hear people say, well, you know, they just need jobs. We have a whole population of people out here that are unemployable, cannot read, cannot write, and have horrible social skills. Who's going to hire them? 
We had a guy in custody the other day, uh, for uh, unfortunately for a homicide. He got a, a dollar sign tattooed right in the middle of his forehead. Now, hopefully he winds up going to jail. But let's just say he did and he's going to go apply. Who's going to hire him with a dollar sign tattooed in the middle of his forehead? You know, we got to teach not only reading, writing, and arithmetic, we got to teach social skills. You've got to be able to present yourself. So we can talk all we want about, well, you know, young people style this, that, and the other. You, the walking around with your pants hanging down below your butt is just wrong. I'm sorry. I don't see it. You can't walk in and get a job looking like that. You need to understand how to properly dress, how to properly present yourself. We need, we've got a lot of work. It, this is doable stuff, folks, but we've got to sit down, get serious, and think about everything that needs to be done in order to turn this around. Our kids are dying, and we can stop it, but it's going to take generations to actually see the difference that we want to see. I, I truly do believe, because there's so much work that has to be done. Our kids are being bombarded with negative images all the time. And I was listening to Ms. Burley, she's absolutely right. When you, when you think about how we're bombarded constantly, you know, listen to lyrics of songs, and I know people saying, oh, you know, that has no influence. It does have an influence. If you're constantly, you know, uh, uh, degrading women, if, if violence is part of what you do, that is the thug life is the way to go. I mean, what message are we sending kids when they don't have a role model to tell them anything different? And in, unfortunately, in many of our communities, there is no role model to tell them, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. No, that's not what you need to be thinking about. It's not what you need to be doing. They don't have it. So we need people to fill that gap, to, to pick up the slack. I like the work that Dr. Corbin is doing. He's right, PTSD. Uh, I learned more about PTSD than I ever hoped to, uh, ever wanted to learn when my wife was writing her, her dissertation. She did it on uh, returning veterans from the Iraq and Afghanistan war. And so much of it is, is relevant today. Uh, I have gone to thousands and thousands of crime scenes. I worked homicide for many years, and narcotics, you, you name it, I've probably uh, uh, worked it. And you know, you're standing there and you got the yellow tape stretched around. You might have a body laying over here, or maybe your body's already at Temple, been pronounced, but you, you took them out of there. You got a huge pool of blood somewhere. And what's going to happen while you're standing there guarding a crime scene? Some kid, six or seven years old, who lives on that block is going to say, I need to get home. And you've got to walk them under the yellow tape and to their door. Be careful that you don't disturb any evidence. Murder, seven years old. How are they going to learn reading and math the next day? The collateral damage that's done by violence in our city, we can't even begin to imagine the impact it's had. Can't even begin to imagine it. Yet what's in place to see to it that those kids get recognized and get treatment before they start to act out, before they start to do the stuff that brings them to our attention. So this is a complicated problem and we gotta think about all different avenues. We have a mental health crisis in this city. You know how many people have been murdered so far this year in, in the city? You may not, 127. All right, fine, I can quote numbers for y'all. You, do you know how many people have committed suicide in the city so far? Just from January 1st to April 30th of this year. 64. You ever hear, you ever read that in the newspaper? Anybody ever talk about it? 64 people just April 30th. Uh, last week we had, on, in one day, we had three in one day. We have a mental health crisis. Why is that? What is it that's going on that's causing this in our city? It's not just homicide and violence. There are all kinds of issues that we've got to somehow get our head around and address so that we can have a healthy city. I don't know what that solution is. There is no one solution. It's a variety of things. A piece here, a piece there. I'm willing to do whatever I can to help this along because I haven't given up. After 43 years, I still believe there's a chance. I still believe there's hope. But we've got to get serious about it. You know, arrest is not the solution, but it's part of it because we got some folks that just don't need to be among us. You read in the paper today, some guy that had 44 arrests. He finally got sentenced to 37, 44 arrests. 
I'm off for second and third chances, but I kind of get lost at the 40th and 41st chance. Because again, you're sending a message that behavior is something that, you know, well, we can talk about it. We can, we can work it out. You know, maybe it'll happen. Maybe it won't happen. It doesn't send the right message. There are consequences in life when you do things wrong. And I'm not saying you lock everybody up and throw the key away, but you've got to have some consequences. It doesn't all involve uh, jail sentences, but for example, uh, many, and, and Lou Girola will tell you this, uh, in charge of our prisons, he's getting people in there, um, you know, 20, 25 years old, fourth grade reading levels. Fourth grade reading levels. Now they're doing a lot of things to try to bring that, to, to try to bring that up, but I would argue if, if, if you get sentenced to 10 years in prison, and you enter with a fourth grade reading level, why do you leave with a fourth grade reading level? You literally have a captive audience. It's not optional. We're going to give you something that you can then take back and have a meaningful life once you get out on the street. Otherwise, what do you think they're going to do when they get out? You don't eat some of the time. You have to eat every single day. And if you don't have money, guess what? I'm taking yours. Because that's just the way it is. So, I mean, there are a lot of moving parts here. And I'm, not, I'm sorry for rambling. But what I'm saying is that this is all doable, folks. But I've gone to conference after conference after conference. And these are very good conferences. But guess what? There ain't too much that happens in between conferences. We have got to get serious about this problem and make a difference. There is no reason for Philadelphia to be as violent a city as it is. And I've lived in three of them, and I'm telling you. This bad boy has got a problem. We got some, some deeply rooted problems in our parts of our city that are very, very difficult to get rid of. We do have a serious problem with violence in our city. We've got to stop cherry picking when we get outraged, being so desensitized to crime where, you know, if Trayvon Martin had got killed by a black kid, you wouldn't even know his name. And that's just a fact because people could take and put the racial component in there, and there are some folks take advantage of that. Don't think they don't, okay? There are a lot of people that make a lot of money over society's dysfunction, get a lot of notoriety over society's dysfunction. If he had been killed by a black kid, you wouldn't know his name unless you lived in Sanford, Florida, and if you were a parent grieving, obviously you would know who it is. Otherwise, we certainly in Philadelphia wouldn't have 5,000 people marching when nobody knew the name of Yassine Harvey. 16 years old, dead, kid had done nothing wrong. I mean a good kid, shot down on the streets of our city. Folks, this is doable. I'm with you, but I'm only with you as long as everybody's committed. As long as we get everybody to stop talking about it and start doing something. If budgets start being driven based on real need and not political uh, uh, you know, whims at the moment. If you're serious about education, fund education. But in return, demand good education. This ain't about unions and work rules and all this stuff. No, this is not pro bono work. We're paying you, but here's what we want in return. And we've got to get serious about this. We've got to get real serious about it. Because if we don't, we're not leaving behind the kind of world the next generation deserves to have. And it's our responsibility as adults to give it to that next generation so they can live a better life than we've lived, not experience some of the stuff that we experienced, and then they in turn can take it further down the road and give their kids an even better life. But we're not sitting here having meetings talking about crime and violence, cost of crime, trauma, and all that stuff. Why? Because our kids are not exposed to that. It's not a racial thing. It's as much an economic thing as it is anything else. And as long as it's, it's, if people feel like it's confined to certain classes of people, they, you, you won't get the kind of resources you need to have, but you cannot contain this. This is like cancer. You cannot contain it. You think it's going to stay in the hood, and it's not. It affects everybody anytime, any place, anywhere. And we need to understand that now before it's too late. So that's all I got to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> again, really, it was, 
I'm going to be really, really brief, but as uh, those of you who know me well know that I hate meetings where people are in charge to do something. We've heard the police commissioner, we've heard the mayor say, I'm committed, I need help, I want to be a part of something. So anybody here who wants to be a part of that, take them up on it. Don't sit back, don't wait for somebody else to do it, take them up on it. Anybody who can help Ted Corbin by connecting these victims, these children, these um, these people who may need your help, connect to him. You have your, their information. Jamira is about to be the best director of anything in the city we've ever had. She is here, she is accessible, she wants your help. What are you going to say that you can't do when she comes to you? And Lucas, Lucas is an inspiration. Lucas has shown us that we all can do something. It doesn't cost a lot. A kid calls out, you call back. You can be the mentor. You can be the person that hires the kid this summer. I've got to tell you, my board, my fabulous board, has several times in the last few months made really tough decisions that if I had gone to them just sort of and said, we need to do this, they would say, we don't do that. We don't make program grants. We don't pay people to write proposals. But they have understood that extraordinary times require extraordinary responses. And I think that we all need to stop finding reasons why we can't and look for reasons why we can support our children. I'm really proud that Stoneley is not just talking the talk, but walking the walk. And I have to thank all of you. I have to thank all of you. This is all of our problem. And together, we can actually make a change. So thank you. <laughs> Enjoy the reception. And we're not going to do questions. We're long. We've run over. All the people are here. I encourage you all just to ask questions directly. Thanks a lot.